So hi, I'm Andrew, uh, and today I'm going to be talking about the Fedora CoreOS boot process. And I call this a journey through time and space, because we're going to be walking through both from the start of when you boot to up to a running system, but also we're going to be uh, walking through where in the disk image we actually like pull various bits of the boot process from. So a uh, little bit about me. Uh, I used to work for CoreOS, the company. Uh, and when I was there, I worked on mostly Container Linux, uh, Ignition, and the Fedora CoreOS config transpiler. And then we got acquired by Red Hat. And now I work, uh, in addition to maintaining Container Linux, uh, also on the uh, Fedora CoreOS equivalents. So that's Fedora CoreOS, uh, also still Ignition, and FCCT, which is the Fedora CoreOS config transpiler. Uh, and recently, I've been working a lot on setting up uh, how we do our bootloading. And so that's what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, so in this talk, we're going to walk through the boot process. And as an example, we're going to walk through the boot process where we configure a, the slash var to be on a separate partition. Uh, and we'll set up a systemd mount unit to mount that on every boot. And on Fedora Core OS, the first boot is where we do all of our configuration. So booting and configuration are inherently tied together. Uh, so a quick note, this does not apply to RHEL Core OS. The boot process for Fedora Core OS and RHEL Core OS are very similar, but they are not the same. So do not take this talk as applying 100% to RHEL Core OS. Uh, I'm going to start off by going over a little background about Fedora Core OS. If you were at uh, Benjamin and Jonathan's talk yesterday, that'll be entirely review. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about Ignition, OS Tree, and then before getting into how Fedora Core OS boots, I'll talk some about uh, what a like normal Linux boot uh, process looks like for comparison. Uh, then when we actually get into how Fedora Core OS boots, uh, I'll talk about how uh, grub gets loaded, uh, what's actually in that grub config, and then the meat of the talk is about uh, what goes on into the init ramfs, because that's where we do all of our configuration. And then finally, like what goes on in the real root and what's different on the first boot versus subsequent boots. Uh, and then what we still have yet to implement for the uh, boot process and where we need help there. So. Fedora Core OS, uh, this is like super high level uh, basics. It came out of uh, Container Linux and uh, Atomic Host, and it's only for running containers. Don't try to use it as a desktop OS. It's not designed for that. Uh, it's, it follows the like immutable infrastructure idea where if, uh, you set it up on first boot, you do all of your provisioning, and then if you want to uh, you should instead reprovision with that change. So all of your configuration is uh, set up once, and then you don't touch it. Uh, it has automatic updates that are atomic. Uh, so because you're running everything in containers, you shouldn't really care as much what's on the host. So we should be able to update that without breaking your workload. Uh, it uses OS tree uh, for handling these uh, atomic updates. And it uses Ignition for the configuration. And we'll talk a little bit more about both of those. And then finally. Uh, it's set up so that your install is just a DD2 disk and then uh, injection of a config into your uh, boot partition. Uh, and the advantage of this is it makes your bare metal case exactly like your cloud cases. So on clouds, you'll get, instead of injecting your configuration into boot, you'll grab it from like your EC2 metadata endpoint. But in both cases, you're starting with the same image and uh, the boot process is the same. Your configuration is the same. And so there, there's nothing special about bare metal in that case. So this is a diagram of a Fedora Core OS disk. Uh, this is the same on clouds and bare metal. It's 8 gigs in size. Uh, and don't worry if this is a little overwhelming. We'll return to this and walk through everything in it. But you basically have, it's a GPT disk. You have your MBR, and if you have a GPT disk, all your MBR says is there's one partition, and it's GPT. Uh, then you have your actual GPT partition table. Uh, and on this disk, we have four partitions. We have uh, boot, your boot slash EFI, or the EFI system partition, 
uh, BIOS boot, which is just uh, used to hold grub for when you're doing uh, booting on BIOS, and then root where all of your actual content is. And then finally, at the end of the disk, there's a GPT backup header. And unlike MBR, GPT has uh, a backup. So in case your uh, initial GPT header gets corrupted or deleted or something, you can recover your partition table. And it's worth calling out that uh, normally on a UEFI booting system, you'll have things like your kernel and you know, RAMFS and grub config in your EFI system partition. That is not the case on Fedora Core OS. The only things in our EFI system partition are your EFI executables and a small shim grub config. So let's talk about OS tree for a second. Uh, its tagline is kind of like Git for your operating system. So the idea is you have commit objects that you can deploy. Uh, it lets you do atomic rollback. Uh, and unlike Container Linux, where you had an AB partitioning scheme, uh, OS tree uses hard links. So in a given deployment, you all of your files are hard linked into the repo, so you get sharing between deployments. Uh, and that means you don't need twice as much space uh, for having two very similar uh, deployments. Uh, and each of those deployments are basically just like a, a git uh, commit checkout. Uh, so if you look at like what's actually in an OS tree disk, this is like if you were to just pop the disk out of your computer and mount it. Uh, we have a directory for boot, and that's actually not used by OS tree. It's just a convenient mount point to have. Uh, and then everything is under slash OS tree. Uh, there's a repo directory, and you can think of that kind of like your .git directory, uh, where it has all of the actual uh, objects. And then you have uh, deploy, and that's where you check out those uh, commits to. Uh, OS tree supports actually installing multiple OSs at the same time. On Fedora Core OS, there's just one, so this like OS name would be just Fedora Core OS. And then in there, you have you know multiple deployments. So in that case, in this case, it's hash one and hash two. Those are like full shaws, but those don't fit on a slide very well. So, uh, and in each of those, that's where you'll find your normal like slash user slash Etsy. That it looks like a normal like oh. Uh, Linux uh, root. And then uh, because when you do like an update, you don't want to delete all of var, like you want to ha like carry state between updates, uh, within an OS, the var is shared. And as you'll see in the next slide, uh, that, that will get mounted to uh, the correct place uh, on boot. So this is what a running OS tree systems uh, important mount points look like. You can see that uh, your root is mounted to that uh, deployment, and that you'll notice that user is also has a special mount, and that's so that we can mount user read only. This is to, uh, to prevent people from making changes to the system because it's an immutable OS. Uh, you can see that var is mounted uh, to the OS's uh, var directory. And there's a couple other mounts here. Uh, the boot and boot EFI are just normal mount points like you'd expect on other systems. And then there's also this mount point sysroot, and that's kind of an escape hatch back to the uh, root of the actual block device. So when you do something like doing a new deployment, you actually need to access that repo. And so you do it through the sysroot. And finally, we want all of our state in var. And so all of your directories like home or opt or uh, serve where you like find state normally are all symlinks into corresponding directories in var. And so this means everything that changes on your OS goes in var. So let's talk about ignition now. Uh, ignition is how we do all of our machine configuration. Uh, it configures machines using a JSON config. Uh, it's a declarative configuration. So instead of saying, like, I want to do, like, partition it, then create a file system, then create files on it, you say, I want this partition to exist, I want this file system on it, and I want these files to exist on that uh, file system. And it's designed to run in the init RAMFS. So 
Uh, the init ramifest is very early in the boot process before you've mounted anything. And so because nothing is mounted, we can do things like repartition the disk you're using that you normally wouldn't be able to do on a running system. Uh, and it'll handle tr things that are traditionally handled by like an installer, so things like partitioning, creating file systems, uh, but as well as also like things that would normally be handled by configuration software like CloudNet. Uh, so things like creating users, creating files, setting up system D units, that kind of thing. Uh, and because we have this unified disk image and because it runs in the init ramifest. That means that all of your configuration on clouds and on bare metal can be the same. And depending on what you're setting up, you might even be able to use the exact same config. Uh, the configs themselves are not easy to handwrite. Uh, they're a JSON file, and like things like inline files get base64 encoded. And so we have a tool called the Fedora CoreOS Config Transpiler that takes a human-readable format that has sugar for common actions and transpiles that into your JSON configuration file. Uh, it runs in four stages, and we'll get into more of this later. Uh, but you have the disk stage that handles your typical like installer-type tasks of partitioning, creating file systems. It has a mount stage for setting up uh, mount points uh, that the file stage uses to do all of your configuration, and then an unmount stage to tear down what it did in the mount stage. And finally, I actually lied earlier, there's actually two configuration files. Uh, one is what we call the base config, and that is all of your like OS vendor configuration. So on Fedora Core OS, there's a default user called Core, and that's actually not shipped in the OS image, uh, but instead in the base config. And so the base config says that this user should be created, or should exist, rather. And then the user config is actually, that you specify, is merged into that config. So this is an example of a Fedora Core OS config. Uh, yes? So uh, if you talk about the you know, config step doing the partitioning and stuff like that, mm -hmm. how does that reconcile with, you know, when you, when you have to do things like rollbacks? You know, how do you undo that? Uh, the so it only happens on first boot, so there is nothing to roll back to beyond that. Yeah. Uh, th this is a example Fedora Core OS config. In this case, when uh, FCCT runs on it, it'll actually just generate an equivalent JSON config. There's nothing magic happening. Uh, it specifies that on device dev slash VDA, uh, there should be a partition with. Uh, Partition number five, labeled var. Uh, the start and size zero are special keywords, basically saying find the largest available block of space and use it. Uh, it says there should be a file system labeled var that exists on that partition, uh, and it should be formatted as XFS. And when ignition files runs, we should mount that at slash var. And then finally, there's a systemd unit that will get put in the real root. Uh, that says that should be mounted. This is the ignition config. It's the same thing, just as JSON. So now I'm going to talk super briefly about how normal uh, Linux booting works. So in the simplest case, you have no init RAMFS. Your firmware loads your bootloader like grub. Grub will load your kernel. And there's a kernel command line argument called root that just says what device should be mounted as your root. Uh, and Linux will mount that there, and then exec sbin slash init as your PID1. And typically that's like systemd now. Uh, but there's a problem with that of like, what if I'm using Lux, or what if I'm using RAID, and I can't just mount a device as uh, root. So that's where the init ramifest comes in. And the idea there is you basically take a file system tree and bundle it with your kernel, uh, and instead of directly mounting your root argument, you, uh, the kernel will uh, unpack that and mount that as root. And then that will set up whatever it needs to do to get your actual root file system available, mounted at typically slash sysroot, and then switch root into that. And that switch root operation you can think of as basically just a sure root and exec. Uh, and that's not a fork and exec, that's an actual just exec. So the new uh, slash sbin slash init replaces the original. So Fedora Core OS 
uh, is a little bit more complicated because we do all of our configuration also in the init RAMFS. So that's everything in bold here is in the init RAMFS. So you still have you know, your firmware loading your bootloader, your bootloader loading your kernel in init RAMFS, uh, but now we need to do a lot more. So first, Ignition only runs on first boot, so we need to figure out if this is first boot or not. And if it is, we need to partition and format disks with Ignition. Then we need to find root, uh, mount that, have OS tree set up all of its mounts, uh, and mount any other file systems, like in our example, we're also setting up a mount for var. Uh, and on OS tree systems, var is unpopulated by default, it's just empty. And before we run the, all of our configuration, we want to make sure that we're configuring things on top of what the base system looks like, so we need to populate var. Then we can do all of our configuration with Ignition, like creating users, files, files, uh, files system D units. And then we need to tear everything back down so where we just have uh, the root mounted, because we don't want the first boot to be different. You can imagine if a boot only worked because we left something mounted that Ignition mounted, uh, then when we go to reboot, we're going to run into an issue where it worked the first time, but didn't work the second. So we want to avoid that. And then we do our normal switch route, and uh, then you're running in the real route, and you can start all of your systemd services normally. So let's talk about how we uh, load grub on BIOS. If you know, there's nothing special about this. Uh, it's a standard BIOS bootloading. Uh, the uh, BIOS will load the first uh, sector of your disk and start executing that. So that's this grub bootstrap. And you only have uh, 446 bytes to work with there, so all it does is just load the rest of the grub code, which is in the BIOS boot partition over there. And that loads grub, and then grub is configured to load uh, your grub config from slash boot. And so that's that uh, grub config in red, and I'll show you that a little bit later. Uh, also in slash boot, we have uh, obviously our actual uh, kernel and in RAMFSs, uh, but we're also using the bootloader specification. So instead of uh, the grub config defining all of the entries in your menu, those are all defined by bootloader snippets, which are all of these entry.conf files. And so they typically look like this. It's a pretty simple format. You have a title that should be displayed, paths to your init RAMFS and kernel, uh, and then all of your kernel options. And by using this, we can actually get rid of uh, the need to ship like grub make config and regenerate the grub config every boot. That enables us to have a static grub config we don't need to change. Uh, and the grub, and it's, it's meant to be a bootloader independent specification. So grub has an implementation of it, and all it does is look in uh, slash boot slash loader slash entries and create menu entries for all the uh, things to find there. So if we look at the kernel options we uh, use, there's a standard root option that says like what our final root should be. And then there's this dollar sign ignition first boot. So that's actually a grub variable that will get expanded. And I'll show how that works in a sec. There's a platform ID. So this is taken from a Kimu image. And this just tells Ignition, like, hey, you're running on Kimu. Like, you should fetch your config using the Kimu method. And then there's this OS tree parameter. That's, that path is actually a symlink that uh, points to where the actual OS tree deployment is. So this is our grub config. Uh, the first two lines uh, just find the boot partition and set that to both the boot and root variables. Uh, the root variable is used in the next section there where it says, uh, if the file exists slash ignition uh, dot first boot, that is relative to the root variable. So that's uh, on a running system, that would be slash boot slash ignition dot first boot. And that's just a file that says, this is the first boot. and at the very end of our boot process, we'll delete it. So it'll only happen on first boot. Uh, and if that file exists, we set that variable that was included in our kernel command line to say, this is the first boot. Also, we need to turn on networking, which is this rd.neednet and ip equals dhcp. Uh, and then finally, this last line, the bls config says, go and read all of those config files and generate the menu entries. 
And that one uses this boot variable that we also defined earlier. So on UEFI, uh, things are a little bit simpler. Uh, UEFI knows how to find the EFI system partition. And if you don't have any like EFI configuration set up, it will fall back to loading this boot x64.efi. And that is our secure, secure boot shim. Uh, so that is signed so secure boot can load it. And then that will in turn load uh, the grub executable, uh, which will read this grub con config file. And that grub config is just a shim that loads the same one that the BIOS loads. So we share the same grub config between UEFI and BIOS. Uh, the grub prefix variable is a special variable that says, like, this is where I expect to find like, my, norm my config. And when you switch to normal mode, that gets implicitly loaded. So BIOS and UEFI are basically the same path. So now that we've got the kernel loaded and loaded the init ramfs, now we get into the meat of things. And this is everything the init ramfs needs to do. The things in red are things that happen every boot, and everything else is things that happen just on the first boot. So we need a way of deciding if it's the first boot, and conveniently we have a kernel command line parameter that grub passed us, which tells us if it's the first boot or not. Uh, we need to do anything we need to do to prepare to run ignition disks to do all our partitioning and file system creation. We need to run it. We need to mount the root device and set up all of the mounts. We also need to mount var on a normal boot that would happen in the real root, but since we need to populate it, we need to mount it in the init ramfs on first boot. Uh, then we need to mount any file systems we defined in our ignition config. We need to populate var, do all, all of our configuration, and then tear everything back down and switch root. So if you look at the man page uh, from systemd for boot up, uh, there's a bunch of systemd targets and mount points. Uh, there's some basic initialization that happens, and once that's completed, you've reached basic.target. Uh, then there's a target for saying, I have found the device that you said was root. Uh, there's a mount unit to mount it to slash sysroot. Uh, there's a target for saying, OK, so I, I've mounted it, and now it's ready as a normal Linux file system. So this will happen after o we've done the OS tree prepare root and fixed all of the mount points to look like a normal Linux file system. Uh, these two in gray are not used by Fedora Core OS. So you can basically ignore them. Uh, there's uh, this uh, initrdfs.target is for any other file systems that you might need to mount. So if you were on a system that had like a separate user and needed that to be mounted before you switch root two, that's where that would come in. Uh, and then initrd.target says, I've done all of my init ramfs configuration. I am ready to do the switch root. So this is what that looks like. And Everything on the right is the stuff that only happens on first boot. And so we have a systemd generator. Uh, and systemd generators run before you start any units. And they can do things like create units, create dependencies uh, between units, and things like that. So we use that to pull in all of these units on the right if that kernel command line option is set. So. And if you kind of break this down into groups of units, uh, the CoreOS GPT setup and that chunk up there is all stuff to prepare to run ignition disks. This uh, section here with the uh, initrd root device is all of the stuff to set up your rootfs. And then the stuff over there is the stuff to populate uh, var and configure it. And then finally, once you've done all of that, we're ready to switch root. And we'll, we'll get back to this slide, too. So what needs to happen for ignition disks? Well, we need a disk that has a valid GPT uh, partition layout. And we actually don't have that by default. And I'll get into that in just a sec. Uh, we need to find our base config. Uh, and we need to find our user config. So. If you're on a cloud, uh, the user config actually won't exist because you're getting it from a cloud metadata service. But if you've installed, installed the bare metal, you need to go grab that off of your boot partition. And then finally, since Ignition can do things like fetch file over network, we need networking up. So the GPT is invalid by default because uh, 
It has a disk UUID, which is a unique identifier. And since you're DBing the same image everywhere, it's not going to be unique. So we need to scramble that. Uh, and the backup header uh, should be at the end of the disk. And since you just DD'd an 8 gigabyte image, it's not at the end of the disk. It's 8, gig 8 gigabytes in. And so we can fix both of those with an sgdisk command. So that's all this unit does. Uh, the ignition setup just copies some files around. So it uses that platform ID uh, that you saw in the kernel command line arguments earlier to determine what platform you're on and grab the correct base config for that. Uh, and then it also will mount boot, grab a user config if it exists, and then copy it to that path. And that's where ignition will read these from. And then finally, for networking, uh, we just use Dracket's legacy networking. We want to move away from that and use uh, Network Manager. That will enable us to not need these rd.neednet and IP kernel uh, command line parameters, because we can pull in Network Manager just as another unit in our graph. Uh, but we can just use network.target. So when we switch to Network Manager, we won't actually have to change those dependencies. So now we're ready to run ignition disks. And this is the section of our config that Ignition Disk cares about. So it'll go through and do our partitioning and then create the file system. Uh, the other thing it will do is it'll actually fetch both the configs, the base config and the user config, uh, merge them together, and cache them to disk so that all of the future Ignition stages don't need to go through that process. So this is where we are in our boot process. We've done all of our setup to run. Uh, Ignition disks, and we also, the root device has been available this whole time, so that's also uh, ready. So now we can do our uh, mounting, we can set up all the mounts for OS tree, and uh, then start populating bar. So sysroot.mount is a normal mount unit, it just mounts the device. Uh, this is generated from a, another systemd generator that reads that root kernel command line parameter. Uh, and generates the mount unit to do that. Uh, OS tree prepare root dot service. This is uh, what OS tree does to uh, fix all of those mounts so that uh, when you look at slash sysroot, you don't see like boot and OS tree, but instead you see all of your like user Etsy, all the things from your actual deployment. Uh, and then CoreOS mount var is what actually just mounts var in. And again. On a normal boot, you wouldn't need to do that because that can happen in the real root, but we need to populate it, so we need it mounted now. Uh, ignition mount, uh, all this does is look through your file system section and say, oh, I need to mount this file system to slash var relative to the sys root. And so you can see before we our var was mounted as uh, part of our root partition at a different path. And now we have it mounted as our uh, partition and file system that we just created. So now var is mounted, all of our mount points are set up, and we can populate var. And because OS tree has a blank var by default, if you have like packages in your base OS that need to put files there, uh, we need a way of doing that. And so RPM OS tree, which is the tool that actually creates the OS tree commits for us, uh, will look at all of the packages it's using. And if they have files in var, it'll generate systemd temp files entries to recreate those. So it'll generate a bunch of configuration for systemd temp files. And then we can run systemd temp files and put all of those files back in var. Uh, and so after we've done this, our system is in a state similar to if you have just installed an operating system but have done no configuration yet. So now we're ready to do our configuration with ignition files. If you look at our graph, we're almost done. All we need to do is do our configuration, and then we're ready to switch root. So ignition files internally is split into two parts. Uh, there's user creation and group creation, and then uh, everything else, so like files, directories, and systemd units. And if you're thinking that, oh, we don't have to worry, like th this is our uh, configuration here, all we have is a systemd unit, there's no users to create. Uh, if you remember, that base config has the core user, so that'll actually happen first. We'll create that core user, and then we'll add the systemd unit. Uh, 
And so now that we've done that, uh, all of our prerequisites for ignition complete target have been met, so that's done. And inodr all the prerequisites for inodrd.target are done. We're ready to switch root. And when you go to switch root, that happens by uh, isolating to a new target. So, uh, and when you do that, it's going to stop inodrd.target. And if you've been wondering this entire time, why are those two units in red? That's because they have a special thing called exec stop. So system view units allow you to uh, specify actions that should be taken when a unit stops. And so this is how we do our teardown. So when the ignition mount unit gets stopped, we run the ignition unmount stage. And when uh, CoreOS uh, var mount stops, we run uh, its unmount. And again, this is to ensure that the first boot isn't special. We're not carrying things that ignition did uh, in terms of setting up mounts into the real route so that we don't run into a situation where it worked the first time and then we reboot and then we fail. So switch route happens uh, pretty much like a normal switch route would. Uh, it uh, basically just routes into the uh, sys route and then execs spin in it in there. And in our case, that's system D again. Uh, and the nice thing about doing all of our configuration beforehand is if we, wanted, if we want to configure things in the real roots boot process, we did that before we started it. So we're not trying to configure our boot process during our boot process, which is problematic. So now we switched root, systemd has started up. It's a normal systemd startup. And eventually, we reach this boot complete target. And that just says, hey, we successfully booted. And now uh, we can go and delete this boot ignition uh, first boot file. And so then next time we boot, when Grub looks for that file, it won't find it. We won't add the kernel command line argument to say, this is the first boot. We won't turn on networking in the init ramfs, and our boot can uh, proceed normally. So now we're done. So final part is, like, what do we still need to do? Uh, Live Pixie is uh, one case. So Container Linux uh, supports running out of RAM. So you can just Pixie boot Container Linux and uh, have your entire root be ephemeral. And typically, when people do this, they have all of their data in like var and have that on persistent storage and mount that in and just run ignition on every boot in that case, because they're starting from a fresh root every time. So you can do that. Uh, we want to be able to do that with Fedora CoreOS as well. We haven't had time to implement it yet. Uh, we don't have automatic rollback yet. So on Container Linux, if you fail to, uh, if your like, kernel fails to load or something like that, it'll automatically fall back to the previous uh, uh, installation and boot that instead. Uh, we don't have that implemented yet. It's something we want to do. Uh, and that has to, a lot of that is in the grub configs where uh, we need to uh, keep track of, have we tried booting this? Did it work? Uh, and so we can use that to determine like which entry should we boot. Um, the other thing we want to do is detect if you're using ignition to change kernel command line arguments. Because if you're changing kernel command line arguments, you probably want them to be applied on your first boot. So after we've done all of our configuration, we want to detect that. and. If that is the case, reboot so we can pick those up and then go through the boot process normally. Um, with this like single image uh, where we're not doing like a typical install, that means moving where root is is problematic. So if you wanted to do like root on RAID or encrypted root, uh, we don't have a place to pull all of that information from after we've created the new uh, device, especially if you're replacing root. So we need a way of detecting, like, hey, are, are we going to uh, be moving root? If so, we should take all of the contents of root, load them into RAM, so that uh, after we've blown away the old root, we can still put all those contents back. Uh, and finally, this uh, boot process isn't quite worked out on PowerPC and System 390X with their bootloaders yet, so we need support for that. You guys have any uh, questions? Yes. Uh, how do the ignition configs get fetched? Uh, 
So uh, I'm going to jump way back. Uh, if you look, these are our kernel command line options. There's this ignition.platform.id. And Ignition has a list of different platforms, so like Kimu, AWS, Google Cloud, all of those. And they all have an entry in there. And uh, Ignition will, uh, th that parameter gets passed to Ignition, and Ignition will then uh, look up how to look that up. So on like AWS, it'll hit the EC2 metadata endpoint. On Google Cloud, it'll hit that endpoint. Uh, on Kimu, we use a kind of hacky method where we actually pass it in with, via the firmware config, but it, it depends on which platform you're on. And what protocols does it support? What protocols does it support? So uh, it supports whatever you need on that cloud. Um, so on most, in most cases, it's just HTTP. Uh, Ignition also supports chain loading configs. So in your config, you can say, I want to actually uh, like fetch another config and merge that into mine. And for that, we support most common protocols. I think we support HTTP and HTTPS, TFTP. Um, I think one other, but I, I don't remember off the top of my head. Does it use Matchbox? Uh, sorry, could you repeat the question? Matchbox. Does it use Matchbox? Uh, so. Matchbox uh, will serve its configs over uh, HTTP. And there's actually uh, something I didn't cover is uh, there's an optional uh, kernel command line argument where you can uh, specify a URL that Ignition should use instead of its normal config. So I think it's ignition.config.url. If you specify that kernel command line argument and give it a URL, it'll, instead of doing its normal fetching, fetch the config from there. Yes. When things go wrong, how have you triaged it? What are the techniques you use? Uh, when things go wrong, how have we triaged it? Uh, so Ignition and uh, Fedora CoreOS in general follows the philosophy of if you fail, you should fail hard. So part of Ignition's whole philosophy is you should either get the system you specified or nothing at all. Like the, the worst case is that you get a system that comes up that is like partially provisioned. Uh, and so, unfortunately, this means that if you fail, you're going to be dumped into an init RAMFS shell. And this does make debugging harder. Um, we try to make it obvious like when that has failed, like how to get logs. Uh, but if you're like on a cloud platform, that becomes harder because your console access is typically not great. Uh, one of the things we do want to do is support like forwarding ignition logs to various like cloud endpoints or things like that, but that's uh, still in the works. Any other question? Yes? So you mentioned uh, a little bit about like uh, ignition for the future. You mentioned uh, being able to reformat or move the root file system. Yes. Would that also include being able to do things like further splitting up the, uh, the root fast? Um, like if you had to put an additional map point or directory and do like a more complex partition layouts? So the question is, uh, we, we talked about uh, in the future being able to move the root FS. Uh, does that also include being able to further split up the root FS into uh, like more mount points? Um, to some degree, we already support that. So uh, things under the like OS tree uh, section, like your everything that's not under var, do need to stay together, uh, but. We already, within var, you can actually divide up var however you want. Like, that can be arbitrarily complex uh, already. Okay. Any other? Uh, yes? Uh, so you know there are some differences between Fedora Cordes and Red Cordes. Can you talk about them? Yes. So the question is, uh, I mentioned that this does not fully apply to uh, RHEL Core OS. Uh, what are the differences there? I'm going to go to another slide. So uh, RHEL Core OS is using an older version of Ignition, uh, which does not have this Ignition mount and unmount uh, section. And because of that, uh, and because we need to populate var on first boot, uh, what 
RHEL core OS can do with VAR is less flexible. And so a lot of this is the same. So like pretty much everything up until this point here, the initrd rootfs.target is pretty much the same. It's this stuff here where we deal with mounting VAR, populating it. That part is different. Any other questions? Yes. Oh, uh, sure. Okay. <laughs> so the Fedora Core OS is the upstream of Fedora Core OS? Is it down? Uh, so the question is, is Fedora Core OS the upstream of RHEL Core OS? Uh, mostly. Uh, <laughs> so things do move from Fedora Core OS into RHEL Core OS, but there's also some things that move backwards the other way. Uh, it's not a strict upstream and downstream relationship. Uh, yes? So uh, early on in your slide deck, you showed um, um, the, the config, the YAML config, right? There was this flavor label. What is that about? I mean, it says FCOS, so I assume there's something special about that? Okay. So the question is, in the Fedora Core OS config, there's a variant label uh, that says FCOS. Uh, what is that about? So uh, we try to make our configs descriptive about what they are. So we, there's both a variant and a version. Um, because writing ignition configs is hard, we wanted to make uh, our transpiler easy for other people to extend for their own OSs. But at the same time, we don't want a bunch of configs floating around that aren't descriptive about like what OS they're targeting. So that variant there is saying, this config is for Fedora Core OS. So that if other people who want to use Ignition want to write their own similar tool, there's a standard way of saying, like, I, this config is conforming to this version and targeting this OS. Don't try to use it on other OSs. Yes? A lot of what you described here doesn't really have anything to do with containers themselves, which is a good process. Where does that part come in? Is that part of the system you can find? The question was, uh, a lot of the boot process here doesn't relate to containers. Uh, where does that come in? So yeah, so if I go to our list of everything uh, that needs to happen, that's way down at the bottom in Start Normal Services. So there's nothing special about how we launch containers on Fedora Core OS. Uh, but if you wanted to set, like, where this would come in place is if you wanted to set up a systemd unit to, like, say, run Podman Run or uh, Start Docker or that kind of thing, you do all of the setup for that to uh, get it ready to run that in this boot process. I guess maybe rephrasing my question, just there's nothing here that prevents us from doing a different kind of boot. The uh, question is, 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 there's nothing in here that prevents us from doing a different kind of boot. In terms here. of maybe booting into a different desktop instead of containers or something yeah, like Yeah, so the, the, the boot process here is not prescriptive about what kind of things you could set up. So Fedora Core OS is not designed to like run on a desktop, for example, uh, but if there, there's nothing in our boot process specifically that prevents people from trying. Just don't. <laughs> yeah. We try to keep the boot process generic and not like limit the scope of what people can do with it. Any other questions? All right, thank you. Sure, sure.